So, guys, it's a pleasure we're here uh, with Grilled the Expert, Tom. And yep. um, I don't know how this got started. I don't know what kind of kernel of thought that you had to bring uh, this to the Mike and Tom uh, podcast, Talk with Mike and Tom. But here we are, and today we have a very special guest. Well, we have uh, Dr. Sean Cruzen from the Coca-Cola Space and Science Center at Columbus State University. And uh, I wanted to ask him first, we're going to talk a little bit about physics oh. because he is a physicist or astrophysicist. Which is it and what's the difference? Well, that's, that's uh, a good that, question. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just interject now before, <laughs> I know where you're going, I know where I'm going, but maybe some people out there do not know. So if I could just interject yep. mm -hmm. and ask Dr. Cruz and just tell us a little bit about his background, maybe how he got started. Okay. What was yeah. what was fascinating yep. for him that got him into this? So, uh, Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. It's really good to be here. Thank you for uh, for having me in today. So, uh, how did I get started? Yeah, I got started. I, I had a very very different life path, career path, at the time that I became interested in how our universe works. I was actually a, I had been a mass communications major. I worked in radio and television for a couple of years and. Did not complete that degree. I, uh, I decided to drop out of college the first time, and I know a lot of people at my university don't like me to tell that story to prospective <laughs> students, but the fact of the matter is I dropped out and had about five years of just life experience where I did things in the entertainment field and music field and played in recording studios and, and those kinds of things. Now, during that time, however, I, uh, I began to be very interested in the beauty and wonder of the nighttime sky. And I might sure. throw in there that I grew up in the great state of Colorado where you can really see the nighttime oh, big sky. big sky country, yeah. right? Dry yeah, sky, it. high altitude. You can see the stars very, very well. And, and almost from a nature lover perspective, got interested in the workings of the nighttime sky. That was about the same time that Halley's Comet, or we know it as Halley's Comet, Comet Halley, was making a visit to the Earth back in 1986. And I got very, very interested in that and... Um, borrowed a telescope from my brother-in-law and used to do, I, I, I took people out basically into the prairie and showed them the, the comet and showed them the nighttime sky. And, and, and through that, that whole circumstance, I became very interested in, number one, knowing more myself about the nighttime sky. And number two, showing people, sharing that passion with other folks. And so that kind of led me down the, the career path that I followed. I, I, I decided pretty quickly that I just my my knowledge was just way way too limited for what I wanted to uh, understand and what I wanted to do, and and so I looked around basically at well you know what what degree programs are out there that I could maybe jump into right. and the very same college that I had quit from a mass com degree actually had a physics department, okay. so I thought well maybe I'll just go take some classes and I, right. I you know I don't know if I want a degree in physics but. Go to I want to take that. On campus, yeah, I want to take that intro it. astronomy class. I want to take some of their physics classes just so I can not look foolish when I'm talking to people that know more than I do about astronomy. And of course, once I got into that degree program, I found that that degree was really fun. I had some absolutely wonderful undergraduate professors. That institution reminds me a lot of Columbus State University in the sense that it was a regional university, and I really think there's a great role for regional universities for people like myself that don't just immediately come out of high school with a, with a high performance, you know exactly what you want to do. Right. You, you have to explore around a little bit with life. And, and then you know, the, a regional university really provides an access point for those folks to get in and really have a shot at kind of resetting uh, their track in life. And so I, I feel like that, that's what my, uh, my undergraduate institution, University of Southern Colorado, did for me. And uh, the professors nurtured me along, and I, I, I guess... At the time, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll teach science. Maybe I'll be a high school science teacher or something like that, which I think is a, would have been a great profession for me, by the way. Mm -hmm. But one of my professors along the way just said, Sean, you're doing really well because your interest is driving you. Have you ever thought about grad school? And, of course, that answer was no. <laughs> right. I said, are you kidding? No, I have not thought of it. Me, like a, an advanced degree in science? No, not <laughs> right, really. Right. You know, and, and I'm sure all the people in high school would have agreed with me at that point that knew me. But, but it, it, it was a kernel of an idea. And then I, I began to pursue it. I began to have more conversations with that professor, and he, was, he really encouraged me. His name is Dr. David Spenny. Doc, Dr. Spenny really encouraged me to think about that and to, and to look at the possibility of just going with, with a, a physics degree program at the graduate level. 
ultimately, that's what I ended up doing. I went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I received master's degrees in both, um, both a master's and PhD in physics. And so the, I'm getting around to the question now, which was, what's the difference maybe between an astrophysics degree right. yeah. and a physics degree? Well, there's lots of different branches of physics. So there are, you know, there's applied physics, and there's material science in physics, and there's uh, quantum physics, and there's uh, there are lots of different fields. Uh, it just turns out uh, condensed matter physics, solid state physics. It turns out that astrophysics is just another sub-branch right. that specializes in things that are not on the Earth, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's physics applied to objects that we observe in the universe. And so, so it's, it's the same physical principles. You take the same physical physics classes, uh, but, but then you learn how to take those concepts and those ideas and apply them specifically in the environment uh, that is extraterrestrial. It's off the world. So that's, that's what an astrophysicist really does. Takes that knowledge of physics, applies it to mysteries that we find in outer space, and tries to solve those mysteries of outer space objects. Was your uh, UNLV program more research-oriented, mm -hmm. or was it more applied-oriented? Yeah, so and, and within physics, there are two kind of distinct branches also. There's, there are theoretical physicists who spend a lot of time with computers and mathematical models, and, and they're, they're in a in a computer lab more often than they are in a, an actual hands-on laboratory. And then there are the experimentalists, yeah. who are the ones who are out actually building apparatus, taking data, trying to you know, figure out ways to measure things, actually be out in the physical world making those measurements. And so uh, on those two ends of things, I leaned toward the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of an experimental astrophysicist. In other words, I was an observational astronomer. So my time was at the telescopes, collecting light, with my light buckets, which are what big telescopes really are, and then trying to analyze that light to collaborate or corroborate, I should say, or correlate our observations with what we know from the theoretical side. And, and that's basically how science moves forward, right? Somebody has an idea, they postulate that as some kind of a mathematical model or theorem. Then people go out and see if that correlates to real observations we can make in the real world. If it does, great. If it doesn't, then there's a problem. So we go back to the drawing board on the theoretical side, and then the theoretical side moves forward. So it's almost like a right shoe, left shoe approach, right? And so, well, that's what I was thinking that some of the Einstein theories, I mean, there's, we're still working on some of those. Absolutely. Uh, are. All the gravitational stuff. And there's probably been some of those that have come to fruition because of that research on those early theories that came out. Yeah, no question that that's true. You know, uh, Einstein did, <laughs> when you say Einstein, I mean, he, he did, his work was so broad-based that there's not just one of his concepts or ideas that we're still in the process of verifying. There are literally dozens of ideas that came out of his work that, that modern physics, in terms of experimental scientists, are working today trying to verify or expand on those ideas or things like that. Um, everything from, you, you can think about the, some of the biggest physics projects on Earth from an experimental side, things like uh, the advanced light source at CERN, where there, there's a giant particle uh, collider, right? And they're and they're trying to trying to use that particle collider to find, you know, subatomic particles like the God particle and things like that. Well, certainly, Einstein had a basis in some of that work that led to those ideas before we'd even know to start looking for those projects, right? You can also look on the other end of things. That was the very small end. You can look on the very big end. Uh, from gravitational waves right. that come to us from these gargantuan-sized sources out in the universe, uh, like colliding galaxies or colliding neutron stars or colliding black holes, that send ripples literally across the entire fabric of space, which came from another set of Einstein ideas that we have now, for the first time ever, just within the last few years, right. had success in even detecting these things that they actually existed and when I say these things, I mean the gravitational right. waves themselves, yeah. the ripples coming off from these events that are not ripples of light. They're not ripples of energy. What they are is actual disturbances in the space-time continuum itself, the fabric of space that just ripple off through the universe and can actually be measured spatially. And there's a big facility called LIGO, which stands for the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, Glad I could remember that the first time. Right. Didn't have to do two takes on that. There you go. And uh, so th there are two of these. One, one is in Hanford, Washington. The other one's in the state of Louisiana. In 2013, we actually took a group of Columbus State University students 
out to the Washington, Oregon area to do our field course where we do geology and astronomy. Yeah. One of our stops was at LIGO. And at that time, they were telling us all about how they were revamping their systems and they were modernizing them and they were improving them because, quite frankly, they had been looking for gravitational waves for about 20 years and had uh -huh. no measurable results. Huh. And so I, I have to admit, I had the feeling when I visited that place, like, oh, man, you guys are killing it out here. But yeah you're not really finding anything, and that must be a hard road, right? I mean, man, right. yeah. you're, you're getting NSF money. This is a gigantic project. The project itself is consists of these two two-mile-long tunnels where you have these right, so ultra-precise lasers yeah. measuring uh, the distance between the ends of those tunnels and looking for uh, changes in the side, the length of those tunnels that are on the scale of an atom. So that's really, really a difficult measurement. And of course, they're finding nothing, and it just makes me think, wow, what, what a hard thing for them to keep justifying this project. Lo and behold, a couple of years later, they make one of the most important scientific discoveries ever by actually detecting the first gravitational waves. And on, not only just detecting them, they figured out what direction they were coming from. They correlated them to an optical astronomy observation of some bright thing that occurred in the sky. And they could actually measure the energy of the colliding objects, which they then knew were two colliding black holes. So okay. all of that came from that first round of finally getting data from LIGO. And I'm telling these long stories to say <laughs> both of those things can be tied back to Einstein's work, right? Right. So when you say, are we still working on Einstein's work from the 20s? Yeah, we are, yeah. right? And, and these are two examples, the, the Hadron Collider and the, and the LIGO uh, experiment as well as several other large-scale experiments, both in astronomy and in theoretical physics. But, but the thing I, I'm, I'm aware of is that what you said a minute ago, we have these theories, but we also have to have physical ways to measure these. We have to construct things to be able to find if that theory is, holds true yeah. over a period of time, and that's a combination of, of the branch of physics that, that you've been following. Yeah. There's, there was a scientist, a physicist by the name of Weber, that took this idea of Einstein's and said, well, wait a minute. If, if Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is his model for describing how gravity affects the space-time continuum, you know, gra gravity's, gravity's not a, uh, a force we really now know. It's actually a manifestation of bent space. And so Weber was one of the people to say, well, okay, well, if that's true, then there should be these ob observable phenomenon that we could actually measure in a lab called gravitational waves. Yeah, And so he built a, oh, it was probably about the size of a picnic table, the first ever setup to try to measure gravitational waves. Very, ex very famous experiment. I've seen it in many, the pictures of this thing in many books. And that experiment found exactly nothing. And so they kept building this thing bigger. And like, <laughs> it seems like every four or five years, there'd be another bigger experiment. We're trying to measure gravitational waves. Now, that, that was in the 1940s that those first experiments were set up, right? So it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that we actually finally had one that worked. See, the, the, the general relativity model had been verified in so many other ways that physicists knew this gravitational wave thing almost had to certainly be true, but for some reason it was just so elusive they could not measure it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to give you an idea of the sensitivity, I find this amazing, actually. When visiting LIGO... The LIGO facility is on the eastern side of Washington State. So if you think about you know, the United States map, think about the rectangle that kind of represents Washington State, it's almost on the border with Idaho. Well, that facility can measure gentle waves from the Pacific Ocean lapping up against the shore of the western side of Washington State. Mm -hmm. That's how sensitive their instrument is. So those any vibrations of that caliber is all noise to them, and they have to filter all that noise out to finally get down and make the real measurement of gravitational waves. Yeah, if you if you if you kind of think your way through the uh, yeah, wow, impossible the precision the and, the, and the and the and uh, the amount of t attention they have to pay to every possible source of noise, you really well, get an idea of probably, how hard that was. Um, I, I don't know this for sure, but they may be picking up uh, Dr. Hackett's guitar here. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't I mean, that was the first source of noise right. they told me about. They said, and by the way, is there something coming down from Georgia that's kind of a <laughs> vibration periodically? And I, said, I knew I my, should have turned in. My friend, my friend Tom, he's just taking a solo. Guitar players. So there were 
two stories in USA Today yesterday. As luck would have it, we're having this this podcast today. And one was about a neutron star, the size of which was at a level never before measured. Are you familiar with the story? I, I heard the story this morning. So I'm interested in that. And then the other, a, a, a companion story about a, a black hole consuming a neutron star. So first... What is a neutron star? Right. You know, I, I mean, I I understand that it has a tremendous amount of mass. Mass sort of uh, bends space so uh-huh. that that's what creates gravity. From what I'm what you're saying now, so how do those things interact? First, why is that huge star such a big deal? I guess. Yeah. In other words, that it's disruptive to some of the theories, and then the other idea is, so what happens when a black hole consumes a neutron star, <laughs> which I thought a neutron star was sort of a black hole, you know? Yeah, they're, they're certainly in a related class of objects. And so, so probably the best thing to do, though, is talk about what a star actually is. And then we can talk about these exotic stars, because okay. they're, they're really just exotic forms of a star. So if you think about a star, you think of the sun, it's like, well, I understand the sun. It's a big ball of fire. Well, actually, it's not, <laughs> right? So the, sun, <laughs> the sun's not on fire. A lot of people have that misconception. Uh, it's not even. It doesn't even have very much oxygen in it at all. And you know that if your clothes catch on fire, you need to stop, drop, and roll, right? That's because you're cutting off the oxygen supply. Well, the sun's not on fire. It's not made out of oxygen. Primarily, the sun is made out of hydrogen and helium. Now, it does have con- uh, uh, other fractions of contents in it, like oxygen, but not enough to burn. So the the sun is a machine that generates a thermonuclear process in its core. That thermonuclear process, let's, let's divide that word out. Thermo means hot, and nuclear means it refers to nuclear reactions. So there are nuclear reactions taking place at the center of our star that turn hydrogen into helium by this process called nucleosynthesis. So you're generating energy by taking two hydrogen atoms, shoving them together in a, in a manner where they stick together at a nuclear level and become a helium nucleus, you actually lose a little bit of mass in that process, which is really unusual. But where does that mass go? Well, it goes into Einstein's other equation called E equals mc squared, one of his favorite poems, of mine at least. That's my favorite Einstein sonnet. Is it a sonnet or is it a haiku? I'm not really sure. Anyway, E equals mc squared. So, so E means energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light, which we know is a big number. Then you square that really big number, right? So if there's a little tiny bit of mass that disappears, when you take two hydrogens, collapse them together into one helium nucleus, where does that energy go? I'm sorry, where does that mass go? It goes into that Einsteinian equation as the m. It gets multiplied by the speed of light squared, which is a truly large number. And then what do you get out the other side on the other side of the equal sign? Well, you get a little respectable burst of energy. A little puff of energy comes out the other side, right? So mass is actually lost as it's converted into energy. That's why it doesn't violate the conservation of principle of, uh, of conservation of mass or conservation of energy. It's just shifting from one form to right. the other. Right. Well, here's the thing. The sun, uh, it, the sun converts more than 4 million tons of mass to energy per second. 4 million tons goes into the m side of that equation, then gets multiplied by the speed of light squared, which the speed of light is a ridiculously large number, then you square it and you get an even bigger number. What comes out the other side of that equation? More energy than human beings have ever created in their entire existence, including all of the power plants, nuclear weapons, any kind of power source you can imagine ever generated by humanity. The sun generates far more than that in simply one second of that thermonuclear fusion process. So, okay, well, now you've generated all kinds of heat and energy. It sounds like an explosion. That should just rip this star apart. Well, it doesn't because the sun is also extraordinarily massive. And so the mass of the sun is trying to, through its gravitational force, trying to squeeze that gas down into, into a single point. But yet these explosions in the core are trying to blow the star apart. So you have this so what, what, what a star is, you have this situation where it's a balance of pressure trying to rip the star apart from the inside out, 
gravity trying to crush the star down into a singularity and neither force winning. It sits there as a balance, and it does it for billions of years. So a star itself is an amazing machine. It's just on this cusp of a balance between gravity trying to squish it out of existence, pressure trying to blow it apart. Okay, so if that's what a star is, what happens when the fuel's all gone in the middle? So if you've converted all your hydrogen to helium, or at least most of it, well, a star can get by by converting heavier elements like helium into other things like carbon, and it can convert, you know, as long as the star's big enough, it can convert materials all the way up to iron, and so it can synthesize these new things that we find on the periodic table all the way up to iron, but then once you get to iron, uh, squeezing iron nuclei together into heavier elements does not produce energy. It actually begins to cost energy. And at that point, the star's a goner. So then what happens? Well, then gravity wins because the star can no longer produce heat that can cause the expanding out process. So the crushing in process is going to win. But it still has the mass. It still has the mass, exactly. So that's what causes so, the gravity to push in. So Exactly. So all, all that mass is still there. Now, some of that mass has been lost to the universe in the form of radiation, energy streaming out, but mm -hmm. there's, still, there's still plenty of mass there, right? So now you have this star-sized object. And actually, the stars that can get this far are much more massive than the sun. They are, they're more massive than the sun to start with by a factor of eight or something like that. So, so those stars now have nothing restricting their gravity to collapse. And they crush down into smaller and smaller objects with all of that mass, which means the gravitational field around that object gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Because the closer you are to an object, the stronger the gravitational field is. And so, so as this tremendous mass gets into a smaller and smaller shape, a, a smaller and smaller size, something has to stop that collapse, right? Well, there are various then laws that we find from the weird world of quantum mechanics that begin to stop this collapse. And the first of those is something called electron degenerate pressure, which from a layman's standpoint means you can't, two, you can't take two electrons and shove them together into the same exact place at the same exact time. And so since electrons just won't have it, <laughs> then, that, then that resistive force begins to stop the collapse up to a certain mass level. And so there are many objects that are held in place in check from collapsing called white dwarfs that are stopped by electron degenerate pressure. Okay. That's what's going to happen to our sun, by the way, someday. It'll, it'll form a white dwarf based on that process. If the star's more massive, though, even that electron degenerate pressure can be overcome. And so it actually will go past that level of quantum mechanics where you really can. You squeeze electrons out of existence entirely so that you can't have electron degenerate pressure anymore. There, in fact, the protons and electrons cease to exist, and the whole thing turns into a soup of neutrons, neutrally charged particles. And you can squeeze those down a lot farther. So now you've gone past this barrier where you even have electrons and protons that normal mass is made out of. You only have a big ball of neutrons. And that thing squeezes down ever smaller, ever smaller, until another force of quantum mechanics called neutron degenerate pressure stops the expansion. And that's basically almost the same thing. You can't take two neutrons that have the same state, same same position, same time, and shove them into the same location. So it resists that force. And that, that object then stopped by neutron degenerate pressure is a neutron star. Now okay. what you have All is right. you have something with the mass of, say, four or five suns squished down into a volume about the size of our city, Columbus, Georgia. So you could end up with a white dwarf, but then if it continues to collapse further... You end up with a neutron star. Correct. I see where you're going. Correct. The next step is. So the next step is even weirder, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, but let's go. Let's yeah, say. Okay. Let's say right now you have this neutron star, right? right? If you could somehow spoon off a thimble full of neutron star and bring it to the Earth, which would be a tremendously bad idea, by the way, the 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 mass of that thimble full of neutron star material would be so dense that it would respond to the Earth's gravitational field in such a way that it would simply fall straight to the center of the Earth. Because the, material of, the materiality of the Earth itself could not support the weight of that, the pressure generated by that small object. 
Now, here's the weird part. Once it reached the center of the Earth, now it has a speed because it fell in through gravity. So it'll pop back out the other side of the Earth. And then it'll fall back toward the center of the Earth again and pop back out the same side that you started it in. And it'll sit there and oscillate in that hole forever. <laughs> <laughs> so bringing neutron star material to Earth is a... It's an extraordinarily bad idea. I'm not sure how you'd accomplish that anyway, but let's right. not try that, okay? No, All right, so as you suggested, though, there is a, another limit. If you can add enough mass to a star to overcome even neutron degenerate pressure, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, can happen, then that, there's, a, there's a theoretical limit where neutron degenerate pressure uh, can withstand the force of, of crushing gravity, that is called the Oppenheimer-Volkov limit. You might recognize the name Oppenheimer right. from the Manhattan Project. Right. So he was one of the scientists who worked on that. Uh, by the way, the white dwarf line was the Chandrasekhar limit. He's also another fairly famous scientist. Chandra is what we call him a lot, but mm -hmm. Chandrasekhar. So anyway, the Oppenheimer-Volkov limit, once you push the mass past that point and you get to that Oppenheimer-Volkov limit, neutron degenerate pressure can no longer stop this stuff and you have the ultimate collapse, which then defies even our ability to understand what takes place. We leave the realm of understandable physics, at least at this point in our understanding, and all of that mass collapses down into what's known as a singularity. Right. This is a, a phenomenon predicted by Einstein in the general theory of relativity. It was largely disbelieved by um, the majority of the physics community that that could even be a possibility, until we started finding them. We started seeing, well, let me be careful. We started seeing the results of the presence of objects that defied any other possible explanation except that a black hole must be somehow involved. How do you see a black hole? You don't. How do you see the existence of a black hole? You see material around the outside responding to that intense gravitational field in the proximity of a black hole. And that stuff, by the way, is doomed. It's, it's on infall. It's falling into the black hole. So you don't see the black hole itself. You see the results of the black hole. That so when it, when, it, when it falls into the black hole, then really essentially what's happening is all its particles are crushed as well yeah. into that mass. And is that yes. correct? Yes. A black hole is effectively a one-way cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. You drive in. You can't get out. <laughs> and the gravitational field in the immediate vicinity of the edge of the black hole, which is known as an event horizon, that gravitational field is so strong that even light can't escape it. If light's sitting right on the edge, it'll simply go around in circles around that black hole forever. If light gets any closer to the black hole, it falls in past the event horizon. And quite frankly, nobody has a flaming idea what happens to it then. Not the energy, not the mass, not anything, because quite simply our physics breaks down and we can't get any, any information to come out of that event horizon, so we'll, there's no possibility of making a measurement. So it gets weird is the so point. So this right? is the effect, really. You can think about it a different way, too. It's a massive amount of gravity. Oh, tremendous. But the gravity, again, being caused by the, the actual mass, mm -hmm. that's the Einsteinian principle where... The mass is been actually bending the uh, space-time fabric, right? Correct. And, and, and to get an idea, to, in order to surpass the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, you have to have, th that limit exists at about eight solar masses or in that, in that neighborhood, so about eight times the mass of the sun. So in order for us to, to, to get up that high, well, I say us, physics, in order for the universe to get a mass high enough to overcome that limit, you have to jam eight uh, solar masses worth of mass into an almost infinitely small area. You surpass the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, you generate a black hole. Now, that's your, that's your garden variety average off-the-shelf black hole. Oh, okay. Then you have and weird the things. Way, there are black holes everywhere. They're at the <laughs> center of most galaxies, right. if so not all galaxies. The ones at the center of galaxies are not your garden variety black okay. hole because they're not an eight solar mass black hole. They are a million solar mass or more black hole. So those are, those are monsters literally beyond my imagination anyway. And, and, and so we, we know of their effects. We can put some numbers to the quantities that surround the strength of the gravitational field and the radiation emitted and those kinds of things. But quite frankly, I'm not sure the human mind is capable 
of grasping what a supermassive black hole is, other than it makes a great si- title for a song right. by the band Muse. So anyway, <laughs> beyond that, I'm not really sure if, if we can get our head around supermassive black holes. However, the existence of supermassive black holes is what led us to our understanding of this term called a quasar. And something kind of fun is that my advisor, her name is Dr. Donna Weistrop, she had an advisor for her PhD at, at uh, Caltech. His name was Martin Schmidt. He was the one who discovered quasars. So he was the first person to actually explain what a quasar was, that it was this supermassive black hole feeding on material in the centers of these galaxies that are so distant that the redshift from, the, from those galaxies made all the emission lines look crazy, and we could not figure out what the heck we were seeing uh, in terms of observing quasars. So that, that's an interesting uh, you know, family tie, so to speak. There you go. Um, Dr. Hackett, I know that you have a number of questions. Probably we won't get to that many of those questions, but what, what's next? What do you... Uh, what, well, what do you we, we, we got into the, some of the things we're going to talk about were, were about uh, astronomy and black holes and uh, neutron stars, those kinds of things. But the other thing things I think we wanted to maybe take a look at is the whole idea of some of the big... I guess, glamorous ideas from quantum physics. Mm-hmm. Like uh, uh, one is the, uh, the idea of superposition and yeah. uh, the, the idea that uh, uh, the, the other thing, the uh, uncertainty principle where uh, we really don't know where a particle is. We can only predict where a particle might be until we observe it and then it seems like it collapses to where it, it is in that place that's really hard for a lay person to understand it's certainly hard for me to comprehend so so before we dive into the deep pool of of quantum mechanics it's helpful to remind people that the universe is under no obligation to make it easy for you to understand (laughs) right that's one of the that's one of my favorite quotes Uh, one of my other favorite quotes is the universe is not only stranger than we know it's stranger than we can know Mm -hmm. and i think both of those things are, you know, those are good statements to, to dwell on a little bit before we jump into quantum mechanics. So the, the chandra Sekar limit, where you couldn't put two electrons in the same place at the same time, and the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, where you couldn't put in two neutrons in the same place at the same time, both have their roots in quantum mechanics, which basically says this. We, we think of in our macroscopic world, in our big picture world that we experience in daily life, we think about the fundamental... Uh, objects that we want to measure as particles. They're little, you know, like uh, we can break everything down to smaller and smaller billiard balls, right. so to speak, right? And we tend to think of atoms and molecules as being made out of those billiard balls. But the truth is that a whole new branch of physics was required to really help us to understand what's happening at the atomic and subatomic levels, and that's quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, the basic... Uh, the basic entity of existence is not particles, but it's waves. Everything can be described as waves. Now we say we we have a different word for that in quantum mechanics. We call that the 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 state function. It's the state function that really describes all of all of reality, all of all of existence. And so these wave functions, which make up our understanding of of particles, shows us that part the, what we measure as particles in our macroscopic world are just manifestation of these underlying wave functions. Hence the experiment that showed showed light as both waves and particles. Exactly. And so it's not that light is a wave sometimes and a particle other times. It's just that depending on how we measure it, we see particle-like properties or wave-like properties. I've never heard that explained. Yeah. That's fascinating. So that, that really is the clears makes that a lot more clear. It, and, and and it really does help to think about that, right? It's like okay, well, I've chosen to measure light in a certain manner. Therefore, that experiment's going to show me how particles behave, or how light behaves like a particle. But yet, I can make this other measurement, and based on the way I've measured light in this other context, I'm really seeing these wave properties. So, so our choice of what measurements uh, that we choose to make will manifest the more wave-like properties or the more particle-like properties 
of light. You know, what's interesting about that is I was uh, in a dissertation committee meeting yesterday, and we were talking with the with the candidate about measuring this was in human behavior. But so many of these principles are, are seem like they, they're parallel. The, the idea that if you don't, if, if you s- develop an instrument a certain way, then you may show no effect at all. Mm-hmm. In other words, a, a good idea is push poles. It's, they're intended to deliver a result. So a lot of it depends on measurement in human behavior mm-hmm. as well as in uh, quantum physics or quantum mechanics, right? We, we have become very comfortable with the idea that there is an objective reality that it doesn't matter how we make measurements, that we're always going to come up with the same outcome. Because that's exactly how Newtonian physics works. Newtonian physics, basically the underpinning of all sciences. We expect this, this is the real condition, and no matter how I measure it, I'm always going to find the real condition. The problem is that that's not how quantum mechanics works. Quantum mechanics says depending on how we measure things, we're going to come up with different outcomes. And even if we measure something the same way, there's only a probability of coming up with various outcomes. And when that happens, that begins to really get under the skin of classically trained scientists, which, by the way, was was everybody prior to 1920, right? Right. When Max Planck introduced, began to introduce these ideas of quantum mechanics, and Niels Bohr began to really explain what that, what the meaning was behind some of that, that uh, uh, science at the time, people like Einstein just lost their minds. And we, we talk about <laughs> Einstein as being, you know, always correct and being maybe the world's greatest scientist. Well, he was wrong about a hell of a lot of stuff right. with quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. He was wrong again and again. And one of his famous sayings is, stop telling God how to play dice. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry. I blew that. He said, I don't believe that God plays dice. That was his statement about, I don't believe the, the right. probabilities and all this stuff. And it was Niels Bohr that came back and said, stop telling God what to do. That's what, that's, that's, I kind of combined those statements. Right. But the idea is that quantum mechanics really appears to be a probabilistic roll of the dice kind of reality that underpins all of our deterministic objectivism, which just is a strange thought, right? It's a very, very strange thought. Except that in, in statistical analysis, you always come up with the idea of the confidence level. In other words, there's always an element of randomness. And there's a, a thought among a lot of statisticians, if you could just treat for every variable in existence, then there wouldn't be that uncertainty and you wouldn't have to have a confidence level. But it seems to me that if you're looking at measurements at those at a very fine, fine level, mm-hmm. that ultimately you're going to have that in anything you measure to include behavior, mm-hmm. uh, plants growing, any kind of thing. But we're talking about the sub atomic level Uh but what what is always made me think in in terms of the human behavior stuff i've done i wonder if those things really we're not seeing evidence of them and we just don't understand it am i on the right path yeah yeah no i think so i mean i think what what you're saying essentially is that uh trying to uh, trying to account for every element of uncertainty you're getting more and more granular in your explanation of things but what quantum mechanics tells us is in the physical world, the more granular we get, the more we have to actually consider not just uncertainty, but the fact that things are not just objective. They, they behave in a statistical manner. Okay. And that is, that's really a problem for us to think about because nothing we encounter in a daily world does that. If I take a ball and I hold it three feet above the ground and drop it, it's always going to go down. It's not like, well, it went down 97 times, but it went up three times. Right. Right? It's, it, that never happens. It's always the same all the time. But in quantum mechanics, it really does have that kind of variability to say, I'm going to do the exact same experiment on the exact same particle. I'm going to do it 100 times, and 97 times it's going to come out one way, and 3% it's going to come out the other way, and there's no other explanation than that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's the hardest thing to explain when you're teaching statistics. I, I mean, a, a lot of times we don't finally don't go there because 
because students who are trying to learn it are trying to have a practical application so that they can finish a dissertation. Yep. So they don't want to get in the theoretical realm of, oh, well, gee whiz. Uh, you know, no matter what you do, there's going to be some element of unpredictability. And that's what all this, that really statistics are, are about hedging your bets more than anything. Yeah. So there, there's a little thought experiment, which is an interesting one, which is this. This and this, and if you've heard of the famous Schrodinger's cat, it's it's along the same lines. So there's there's a a, a couple, and they're apart from one another. And one's living in New York, one's living in L.A. And a friend of theirs decides to send them a pair of gloves, but the friend's going to send them each one glove. And so the friend boxes up the gloves individually, sends one off to L.A., sends the other one off to New York. The person in in New York opens the box and they see that they have the left-hand glove. Now, if those were really a pair to begin with, they instantly know what the condition of the glove is in the box in New York, even if it hasn't been opened. I hope I got my cities right there. I can't remember. I was confusing them. Right. But, but, the, but the point is, the person who opens the left-hand glove automatically knows the other person has a right-hand glove. Now, that information about what's in the other box suddenly just traveled to them faster than the speed of light. Right. Right? Because if if you were waiting for the person in the other city to open the box, pick up the phone, make the call, the fastest that information could arrive at the other city would be however it however long it takes for light to travel from New York to LA. But the person can actually know that faster. It's instantaneous. It's instantaneous. So there are these things in quantum mechanics which are called entangled particles. That's where I was I was going to ask that yep. question, yeah. And an entangled particle comes from this other notion that you threw out called superposition, mm -hmm. where you have one wave function, one state function, which remember, that's the fundamental entity in quantum mechanics, not particles. One wave function is describing two different particles. The manifestation of that one wave function is two different particles in our macroscopic world. Right, but it's simply one wave function. So let's pretend that there's a wave function that describes these two gloves. Well, once the person in LA opens their box, the person in New York doesn't even have to open their box. They already know the state of the glove that's in the box. But here's the weird thing that quantum mechanics says. The next step for quantum mechanics is to say that if this is really a quantum mechanical system, that what's inside those boxes are neither a right glove or a left glove, that each of those objects inside the box are in some kind of weird superposition of states of being both a right glove and a left glove. And it's not until the box is opened and the measurement of that object collapses the wave function, or in other words, causes the wave function to assume a single value that that glove becomes a left which then instantaneously forces the other glove in the other city right. to become a right. That's the weird part about quantum mechanics. Prior to opening the box, each glove has a 50-50 shot so ha of being a right or a left. Has that been demonstrated experimentally? Absolutely it has. So can you talk about that? How, 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 how does that shake out yep. in, a, in an, an experiment involving wave function the, the the one the one system that i think most people are familiar with is this thing called spin of an electron we know if you remember anything about your fundamental chemistry we know that there's something called the bus seat rule and it's how how electrons can be loaded into an atom in a certain way right so so it, it, it turns out that at any in a given energy state you can't have more than one electron of the same spin so you have to have a spin up and a spin down to sit at a certain energy level. And again, go, go back and look at your high school chemistry book. You'll, you'll find that in there. Well, the question is, well, why is that? And, and the answer was always, don't ask that question. It's just, it's just the way it is, right? Just, just, do the, just put the arrows in there, kid. <laughs> Stop asking hard questions. But really what it is, is that the, those two electrons occupying that same state are in a superposition. They're in a singular quantum mechanical wave function. And that wave function can only accommodate a single spin for each of those particles. 
The interesting thing becomes, though, that if we can somehow separate those two electrons that were once part of their the same combined state, if we can measure the spin of one of them, we instantly know the spin of the other one. Right. And that has been uh, done in a variety of different experiments. And so there are a variety of actual laboratory experiments where you can shoot electron streams through various uh, sets of apparatus and actually have them collapse into a spin up or spin down state, which then causes the triggering of the other one to assume the opposite state. It also, we can see the probabilities of, um, of those electrons being in those states as 50-50 prior to us making the measurement, which is all just weird, right? It's all just really, really strange. Now, are there practical applications to understanding how that actually works? Well, if, if you can imagine this, that in our computer-driven world, that we store all information in binary code, which are ones and zeros, mm -hmm. well, then imagine that that's just right and left gloves or that's a spin up and spin down electron. Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly, if you can determine the spin of a remote electron somewhere in another city like L.A. by making a measurement in your laboratory in New York and you know that instantaneously, you can actually transfer data based on the measurement of spin states of particles, for instance. And it's these kinds of ideas that lead into the weird world of quantum computing, okay. which, by the way, is a pioneer field. We're not there yet, yeah. right? We, we don't have effective quantum computers, but the imagination can become, I can store data, I can access it instantly, and I can store infinite quantities of that data. And that may be the next big technological revolution, right? That generates all the new jobs and, and things we can't even imagine. Correct, yet. correct. Now, I don't want to shortchange quantum mechanical research that's going on in a variety of other fields, like just, just uh, material science. We, we, we understand materials that we can build all kinds of new custom uh, ceramics or, or you know, paints or you know, maybe uh, a film that is uh, photovoltaic in nature where you could actually paint your house and your whole house becomes a solar collector. All of those things boil down to what's happening at the subatomic level, which we understand by quantum mechanics. So those are everyday applications of quantum mechanics that take place all the time. We just don't really think of those. But, but what seems more, I don't know, glamorous, sexy, it's at least filling up the Internet right now, is this whole notion of quantum computing, which it, it's because of the, the astounding, almost infinite capability of data storage and rapid transfer of information that, that we see that as, a, as a, a pioneering area, which is just a frontier that we really want to go explore more. And so that is something that's taking place at the, at the boundary of computer science and quantum physics. So, so really when you're talking about actually applying quantum principles in, in materials, mm -hmm. in material use, uh, not necessarily computing use, it still has some of those same communications ramifications. Yeah. So theoretically, you could have smart paint. You could have Terminator-style uh, bots. You, all kinds of things might could exist uh, that that is right now just the realm of science fiction, right? That's or am, right. I, am no. I too far off base? Well, I mean, look, I mean, any, everything that we manufacture is built of materials. Mm-hmm. All materials at their atomic level behave according to the rules of quantum mechanics. So the more that we come up with designer materials that never existed on Earth before, somewhere there's, there's a quantum physicist figuring out the quantum mechanics that leads to the chemistry involved with developing those new custom materials. So, so the, the, the border of chemistry and physics is really material science. And wow. so, so, so you find you find application at these crossover points, right? You have these physicists doing fundamental research on quantum mechanics. You have these chemists trying to invent new kinds of materials. They find their, themselves at a junction where they're trying to understand the same principles. They begin to collaborate, and that's what moves that forward. In another place, you have the junction between computer science and quantum physics where computer science is trying to solve these problems about data storage and data transfer and, and all these kinds of making things faster, more smaller, all those kinds of things. And you have uh, quantum physicists un trying to understand the nature of matter at the smallest scale. And they find a junction point, and suddenly 
quantum computing is born, right? So, so a lot of times when we come up with new, uh, new inventions, new ideas, new frontiers in what we think of as science and technology, you're seeing these intersections between multiple disciplines where, you know, you know there's, there's even intersections between, you know, say education and physics or between, you know, a variety of other things. You know, psychology, understanding the human mind and understanding how particles work that make up our brains, right? It's, so it's interesting you're going there because I, I, as you're talking, I was thinking back to the idea of human behavior mm -hmm. and human communication and how we evolve and and what ultimately might happen, how people might communicate. Some of the things that seem far out, new agey, may not be so far out in new agey when we realize that really what what's happening in the brain is is uh, chemical interactions and electrical impulses and across synapses, and that that involves energy and energetic connection. So I, one, one of the things from the old 60s idea, you walk in a room and, hey, the vibes are bad there. Well, you know, m maybe people were on to something because philosophers, going back eons, would come up with things that now seem, eh, you know, it seems like there's some basis in science. So it's just, it's staggering. I'd have to give it a lot of thought as to what's out there just almost like magical thinking and what's actually scientific. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> sometimes I've been accused of, hey, you know, that's sort of out in that magical realm. Well, well, is it? Because because I, I approach everything from the idea of quant, of, uh, you know, quantitative analysis. So to me, it's... It, you know, if you want to even have a stab at causality, and I, I don't always believe you, you can have that stab, but if you even want a stab, you've got to hedge your bets again within a confidence level. But then, so how does that, how does the things we're talking about, brain function and those kinds of things, show evidence of the same kind of principles? I'd, I'd be interested to think if, uh, to, to hear if a physicist actually thinks there's something to that. I'm I'm going to just go straight to my favorite philosopher, who is uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, <laughs> who once said on a very important episode that any more advanced civilization with the proper with 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 an advanced understanding and usage of technology will seem like uh, a magician or godlike entity to those from a less wow. developed yeah, society, so true. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so thing so yeah. things that seem magical often do have technological advances. I would say that what we do every day with cell phones would probably seem magical to even somebody from the 1940s, for instance, right? right? If you just took that, that capability back in time and you suddenly had access to every piece of information known to humanity, which is basically what you have That's right. on your hip every day. I mean, think, think what that would mean to someone from the year 1942. Right. 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 That would seem like a magical power. What do you mean you have the entire sum of information from every library on planet Earth in a you know a three by four rectangle that you carry in your back pocket? And as an aside, in ed in the field of education, we haven't even remotely begun to catch up to the capabilities that any student has in their pocket. I, it, I, I remember just when the when laptops began proliferating. And those of us who had come up in the, the paper era, the book era, we, we just, I, I mean, we, we really couldn't figure out where to go with this. Mm -hmm. And yet students were so, you know, the, it called into question, what good is a professor? A professor, there's no way they're going to know what your, what your laptop or your smartphone knows. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all those things come to bear. Well, that's sort of off the, off the topic a little no, bit. No, but it, but it does, it's interesting to know that the, it's actually technology and it's actually the applications of these very principles of physics, even quantum physics, right. that are allowing for this revolution in information technology to take place. Yeah. Right. So now you we're talking about these junctions a moment ago. Now you're talking about the junctions between understanding electromagnetic radiation, which is radio waves, and information technology, which is providing us all this data. And and now you have a cell phone, right? I mean, that's that's what basically what that amounts to. So 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 it, it still it still is an application of all these ideas. And I think in terms of a higher ed standpoint, just to get off my soapbox just a minute. So the the the, the Google machine on my in my pocket can tell me what, but it doesn't tell me why or mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. or how I apply that. And I think that 
one of the things that we need to, to think about as college professors is how to give people context for the information that they can readily adapt. Right. right? You, 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 can, you can access some information, but then what do you do with it? Right. What does it mean? What do you do with it? What's its context? It's a little harder to find that just, uh, just based on what you're reading. Right. So. Yeah, and I, and I think one thing. By the way, I've I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've just been sitting over here trying to take it in. I'm gonna have to watch this over and over again to make some sense out of some things. But you know, right now people are talking about artificial intelligence, and there are some people who are very fearful uh, of what we might do. Based some very on smart some people who are fearful, very, by the way. Very smart people. <laughs> and and what happens is that sometimes the science, uh, um, you know, moves f uh, faster than our ability to uh, resolve ethical questions, moral questions, other kinds of questions that won't do us harm in the long run. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things out there that science rushes ahead. We're trying to discover. And based on what you just said and a number of things you said, I mean, it's very exciting. The future is very exciting on how we might discover some of these connections and uh, then possibly use them. It, it really what you're discussing, Mike, is, is really calling into question maybe in, I was going to say in the long term, but really in maybe kind of an intermediate term, what does it mean to be human? Right. Right? What happens the day that we can actually interface our search engines directly to our brain where the phone itself is then no longer necessary? Right. Where all you have to do is think and some implanted device in your own brain accesses the internet and presents that information to your brain directly. Now that sounds really crazy and way out. It's actually being worked on right no, now. Right. right. right? right? Yes, there yes. are people who are working on that interface at this very moment and having some successes right. in that area. Uh, we talked so, about the uh, Elon Musk with this neural link, I think it's called. Exactly. He is where he's, he's going through some things. So, so the Amazing. interesting thing will be if everybody knows everything all the time instantly, what does that mean to be a human, right? And can and, trigger things wirelessly, by the way. Yeah, right, right. The, you, the, you, your smart house, your smart car. You're or, adapted to the uh, Internet of Things, and then everything is at your <laughs> mental disposal. Yeah, right. it's, it's a weird world, right? It is, And, yeah. and so yeah. what was the conversation we were just having? A superior technology always looks like magic to a, you know, a, a, a less developed society. Well, we're talking about things that aren't existing now, right, but I don't think they're that far away. We're becoming the less <laughs> you know, technologically advanced society, right? It sounds like magic, right. but really we can almost kind of see the pathway. Yeah, we're right. close enough to those things right. that we can see how that develops from here. And, and quite frankly, all of that evolves from our understanding and application of the fundamental laws of physics. Mm -hmm. which I just like to say that physics is pretty much everything. <laughs> well put. Okay, the theory, the theory of everything. I yeah, think we that's right. That right now. Yeah, yeah. You beat Einstein well, to that, right? The theory right. of everything. Yeah. All right. I I love this conversation. We we're going to continue uh, a little longer. I know uh, Sean, you have some things you have to do. We want to be uh, uh, aware of the time uh, constraints we have here. Um, I, I mean, my questions are, are a little more general in a, in a, in a sense. Um, I know you as a director of the Coca-Cola Space Science Center. You guys are doing wonderful things down there. Uh, you're keeping up with the latest. Give us some idea of uh, just some recent events that have occurred that you've been really focused on and maybe some things that are down the pipe just a little bit that we can look forward to. And I'm talking about the rest of us out here who are really fascinated with astronomy and what's happening in our world. Um, what's on the horizon? What are we doing? You know, I, I think this is true. And I, I, you know, I'm going to ask for an apology for repeating something, but, but I think this is just so important that it bears repeating, which is for the entire hi history of humanity, everything that we've ever known about our universe, all of that information has always come to us in the form of light. In fact, one of the things I teach on my first day of every astronomy class, every intro astronomy class that I teach is astronomy's prejudiced. Astronomy is prejudiced to things that glow in the dark, right? We, if, if something's not glowing in the dark or interacting with something else that's glowing in the dark or reflecting light from something else, we don't even know it's there because the only way information travels to us from objects in deep space is in the form of these things that we know of as electromagnetic waves, light, right? Various, various forms that we can see or can't see, but it's still all light. Radio waves, light, 
uh, radio, uh, microwaves are light. All the stuff is light, right? But we've just entered into a brand new era where we now have a brand new tool never possessed by humanity to be able to measure the universe where we don't we can see right through things. And that is gravitational waves. So I know we touched on this earlier in the show, but it's important, I guess, to, it bears repeating to say, we don't know where that's going to lead us. We can see into the heart of a galaxy through obs- any manner of obscuring material because the information coming to us is not electromagnetic radiation. It's these ripples of the universe called gravitational waves that just penetrate right on through. And now we can actually measure them, which is simply astounding, right? And so so when you ask what's next, I think in the world of astronomy, we're going to spend a lot more time measuring gravitational waves. And it's not that we'll give up our pursuit of ever better ways to measure electromagnetic radiation because you always want to correlate those observations, right? You want to say, well, we can see it in, in microwaves and we can see it in radio, but now we can also detect its gravitational wave signature i think that i think that before too long humanity will probably likely build a gravitational wave observatory in space that's not a new idea that idea has been around for decades but now it seems a lot more sexy because hey we figured out we can actually measure these things it's hard to it's hard to justify building building a gravitational wave observatory in space when the ones on the ground aren't measuring a darn thing right, <laughs> right. you've never measured it ever but now we have, we've entered into a whole new era where we have gravitational wave observations. So the impetus to build that next generation of detectors of gravity waves, gravitational waves, is now there. And so what will they reveal about the history of our cosmos or multiverses or the lack of multiverses or whatever? We don't know. We don't have the faintest idea. But that is certainly what I can see on, on the horizon in terms of I mean, we, we have just found, we are in the absolute infancy of a brand new technology that we can measure the universe in a way that we never even fathomed before. What, where will that lead us? I have no idea. That's incredible. But it's exciting, yeah. right? Super, it's, super it's exciting. Out there. Well, Tom, um, what about your question? Any, uh, I mean, you've got Sean I, right here. I, uh, I think probably us, so. that would, that some of those would be best left for another show, but the, w- I, I'm sort of thinking about the uh, the ideas of uh, of the big three right now: dark matter, dark energy, and string theory. Those yeah. are things yeah. that that I, I think the layperson does they don't really comprehend. And yet, I I also think about the most popular comedy on television for years was the Big Bang Theory, and I think part of that was because the writing was so good and the science a lot of times was mm-hmm. so strong, and that lay people could watch the show and sort of get a sense for although the uh, humor was in the quirky characters the the big payoff was doing big things with big science so uh anyway i i think maybe down the road those might be some things we want to talk about at uh at some length and maybe frame them up some kind of way to where they might work together. Yeah, just just as a quick preview, and I, I, that certainly I agree with you. It deserves its own show. But just as a quick preview, all of those things you just described are at that. We talked about these junctions, these interfaces of science. They're at the junction between Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes our big picture view of gravity, and quantum mechanics, which Einstein didn't even believe in. He never really accepted it fully. But we know now as is an accurate description of certain phenomenon. So the very biggest scales of the universe, how that works, Einstein's theory of general relativity, the very smallest scales of the universe, how that works, quantum mechanics, that boundary between those is where we will ultimately find the answers to many of those things you're discussing. And and we can go in, into great detail about that probably in, a, in another show. Got to tell you, um, just uh, th- this was... Uh, sort of an interview set up and everything, but it really shook out to be more of uh, the kind of conversation you had back in college, maybe uh, uh, sitting up in the dorm room where you you just kind of kick things around. I ask the questions about the things that that fascinate me and yet that I have very little understanding of, but I have just enough understanding to say, oh, yeah, well, if it works in quantum physics or if it works in general physics, then it'll work in human behavior too. 
Don't know if that's true, but I think down the road we may be finding out more things about human behavior just through the studies of people like Steven Pinker and, and uh, folks who are looking at w how the brain really works. So fascinates me from both the gee whiz of big science and also the my uh, personal fascination with human behavior from having been a teacher for so long. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love talking about it too. And, and I think it's those conversations in science or just, you know, in college where you're just sitting around chatting with your buddies that really give you the driving energy to pursue these interests anyway. Yeah. Right? That, it always did for me anyway. Yeah. That's where I gained my enthusiasm to go back into calculus class the next day and really crank out those calculus problems because I had these underlying curiosities that I wanted to satisfy. For for Mike wraps this up, I'll, I'll just share a quick story, and, and you'll remember the the uh, event really clearly. So uh, you and I were playing at a sort of a gig together, and we were <laughs> on a break. And we're sitting around a table, and I said, Hey, Sean, uh, why does the moon look so big? <laughs> you know, it, when it's sitting at the horizon and it's a, a full moon, and I'll never forget the first thing you said. I can tell you, but you're not going to like the answer. <laughs> this conversation was sort of like that. It's just, it's not that you don't like the answer, but it has so many ramifications. I've, sh I've sure enjoyed our discussion yeah. anyway. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me in today. It's fun. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, we need to listen to this one again. There was a lot of information there. But thanks again, Sean. We appreciate Very uh, you, you stopping by. Thank you.